So you've got an exam coming up in three days and you haven't started studying at all. What can you do to get the best grade possible? In this video, I'm gonna teach you how you can study a huge amount in a very short period of time. To be clear, I'm not encouraging you to cram for an entire exam in just three days, but knowing how to cover a lot of volume in a short period of time is a useful skill. If you're new to this channel and you're wondering who I am, I'm Dr. Justin Sung. I'm a learning coach and the head of learning at I Can Study. I'm also a former medical doctor. And for the last decade, I've helped thousands of people learn more efficiently, which does sometimes include doing some hyper cramming. Before we jump in, I'd appreciate if you give this video a like. It really helps with the algorithm, which my life is at the mercy of. So why three days? Well, there's a funny story actually. Back when I was in my third year of medical school, there was this paper that I was studying for. And I actually completely forgot that this paper even existed. And I know what you're thinking, how can you forget that a paper even exists? Well, at the time I was actually using a previous student's notes as my primary source of studying. I wasn't going to lectures anymore. And uh, this student just decided not to write any notes with this particular paper. So I just didn't, like, I just forgot. I just forgot that the whole paper existed until three days before the exam. Yes, I understand it was really dumb. I've been very dumb for a very long part of my life. And so for that three days before the exam, I studied a lot. Like, in 72 hours, I probably studied 60 of those hours. And I ended up getting the worst mark that I ever received in medical school, which was a C+. Plus which I think is like a 65% or something. But the thing is, I was actually quite lucky because that particular exam and that particular paper was very, very fact recall heavy. So I could rely on a lot of just plain old rote memorization and still manage to pass. Funnily enough, that very paper the next year changed the way that they were examining so that you would no longer have been able to do that. The questions got way more complicated, way more nuanced. Like if you didn't properly understand it, you wouldn't have done very well. Also, potentially not surprising, I don't remember anything about that paper anymore. In fact, I remember so little about that paper, I don't even remember what the paper was on. Like I have a vague memory of remembering something to do with the pancreas and that's it. Or maybe it was the gallbladder. Anyway, I've learned a lot more about how to study effectively since then. And I'm going to teach you the right method of cramming if you've got limited time without spending like 20 hours a day studying. So for the first thing about cramming the right way is to understand that you're in a compromised position anyway. You're going to lose something and you have to be strategic about what you're going to lose. If you haven't started studying for something three days before your exam and you're expecting to still do really well, you're either a genius or you're delusional. I'm just going to let you decide which one you are. And a big thing that helped me understand how to cram the right way was actually getting trained on creating assessment questions myself as an educator. I realized what goes on behind the scenes when they're creating an exam paper, how they're thinking about what to test you on. Because if you can think like the examiner, you increase your chance of studying the right thing. Now, most places, most institutions will create exam questions based on some kind of framework. And a common one will be like Bloom's Revised Taxonomy or Solo Taxonomy or really any variation, but they follow the same general principles. There are usually different orders and levels of thinking, and they're trying to assess you on those. As a very general summary, lower order methods of thinking and learning, these tend to be a lot more isolated, whereas the higher order levels tend to be much more integrated, and there's something of a spectrum in between. So that's the first piece of helpful information. Now, the second thing is to know that most institutions in most countries are legally obligated to test you on the learning objectives. Now, they don't have to test you on every single learning objective, and what falls within the scope of a learning objective can be quite a gray area sometimes, but they're still a useful guide to work off. And most examiners are going to think like this. There's a list of learning objectives that they have for that particular subject. Let's say that there are three for one lecture. And they're going to be thinking, how can they test these learning objectives at these different levels of learning? So already this helps to narrow down our focus a little bit. For example, if we have a topic around Greek history, then we might get asked a question at a lower order that's like, describe the major events and significance of the Greco-Persian Wars, who were the key leaders, and what were the key battles and outcomes of this conflict. Whereas for the same subject, a mid-order question might be something like, 
analyze the social and political structure of Athens during the time of Pericles. How did Pericles' leadership impact the Athenian democracy, culture, and empire building efforts? You can see that it's starting to compare and contrast multiple ideas against each other compared to the really higher order questions, which might sound a little bit more like evaluate the influence of Greek philosophy on the development of Western thought, discuss the contributions of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and how their ideas shape not only ancient Greece, but also subsequent intellectual and philosophical traditions. So now it's not just about examining different ideas against each other, but now you have to create a value judgment about how important the contribution of each of these ideas and relationships are on each other. It's more than just knowing that there are differences and similarities, it's understanding the significance of them. If we use another example like microbiology, then we could have a lower order question that sounds like, explain the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells with examples of microorganisms that belong to each category, and describe their basic structural characteristics. Relatively straightforward fact recall, quite isolated. A mid-order question instead might sound a little bit more like, discuss the role of microorganisms and biogeochemical cycles, focusing on the nitrogen and carbon cycles, how do bacteria and archaea contribute to nutrient cycling in ecosystems, and what are the ecological implications of these processes? Again, you can see now, we're looking at comparing different concepts and ideas with each other, but we don't have the idea of significance. That comes through the higher water version, which might sound like critically evaluate the use of antibiotics in medicine and agriculture, analyze the challenges of antibiotic resistance, its mechanisms, and the potential consequences for public health, and propose strategies to address the issue of antibiotic resistance effectively. That's a super broad question, incredibly complicated, but again, you see that they're asking you about the consequence, the significance, the importance of these interactions. So this is going to be the pattern across the board. Any lecture objective, they can test you on a direct immediate fact recall, very isolated. They can ask you about comparisons with related other concepts or objectives, or they can ask you about the significance of them. Again, they don't necessarily have to ask each of these. Depending on your curriculum, sometimes the lecture objectives are actually written in a way that indicates what level they're interested in. So for example, the lecture objective might actually say that what they want from you is to be able to describe the something, 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 which suggests that it's a lower order mastery they're looking for. Whereas if the lecture objective uses words like discuss, evaluate, contrast, these are indications that they want that higher order flair. And so when you scan through your lecture objectives, you can actually get a reasonably good map for how they're likely to test you. Now remember, you're gonna lose something. You're not going to be able to cover every single question. There are gonna be things that you miss but this is a more strategic way of using your time. It increases the probability of getting more questions correct. But this is still not enough because even then, especially if you've got a content dense curriculum, it's going to be very overwhelming. And this is where the idea of logic comes in. How can we help our brain figure out what the right answer is, even when it doesn't actually know the right answer? I mean, it's kind of a fancy way of just saying, how can we guess more accurately? And so if we look at how our brain is able to make logical deductions, it can be even more strategic how we spend our time cramming. Let me explain. Our brain has a network of knowledge. And it's able to use this network to make inferences about new information and new problems. So let's say you didn't study everything and a test question is now asking you about some piece of information that is missing from your network. Well, if you've got enough connections that are surrounding it, you can logically infer the answer. This is something that might be called deduction or logical reasoning. And so obviously, if you've got more knowledge and more things surrounding the gap, then it's easier to make the inference. For example, if the only thing that you're missing is the second step of a process but you know the first step and the third step and you know what goes in and you know what comes out you might logically be able to figure out what happens in the middle to make it from input into output and here's a really strategic part when it comes to cramming is that not all information is the same value from a logical reasoning perspective we can almost think about each piece of information having like logic points the more logic points something has the more useful it is in figuring out other things. Typically, these are going to be the major concepts, principles, rationales. On the other hand, if you have something that is low level of logic points, 
then this is going to be like a very, very detailed technical piece of information. Like, for example, a particular constant for an equation or the particular micrometers of a tubule. This is information which might come up somewhere, but there's limited ways that you can use this information to logically deduce other knowledge gaps. And so this gives us the basis for our hyper cramming strategy. We want to use our time to figure out what are the learning objectives, what are the orders and levels of learning that they're likely to assess us on for each of these objectives, and then what are the pieces of information that give us the most logical deduction power, i.e. which pieces of information have the highest logic points. Now you might be wondering, how do you even know what the logic points of something are? And the answer is that until you really spend more time to study, which you don't have time to do, by the way, you're not really going to know. So you have to make your best guess. The good news is that your best guess is probably going to be reasonably accurate. All you have to do is as you're reading the lecture slides or the course book or whatever resources you're studying from, you ask yourself, how valuable is this piece of information at helping me explain other things in the topic. How helpful is it at making sense of multiple other things in the topic? And you will generally be able to say, okay, well, this seems like it might maybe be related to some other things. Or you might read it and think this seems really specific and it's probably not going to be very relevant. And so what you do is you just ignore the things that seem like they're not going to be as relevant and you just start with the things that feel like they are connected to more pieces. And it doesn't really matter if you miss a few things because first of all, again, you've got limited time, you're gonna pick your losses. But the other thing is that you might get three pages down and realize something you skipped earlier actually is really related. Like it directly explains this other thing that you're now reading about. Well, that's fine. You can just always go back and then learn it now. But the key is to be quite aggressive with filtering what information is helping you reason about the topic and which information is something that you might just end up having to rote learn and memorize, which you've got limited time for. And that's the type of thing that you should really have for the last night of cramming rather than day one of a three day cramming stretch. So here is how I would schedule it. If you've only got three days, day one, spend about one or two hours of that time, which I know it seems like a lot of time, but it's well worth it, scoping through the topic to pick out what are the learning objectives and what are the orders of learning that they're probably going to test me on. This is going to give you a bit of filter for when you're reading the information so you can make sense of how important it is and how much time it's worth investing into it in the first place. You might sometimes find entire lectures where every single learning objective is very, very lower order and memorization heavy. This is the type of lecture that you might want to just completely skip on this first day and come back to later. It's kind of like a nice to have. On the other hand, you might realize that only two or three lectures are really, really dense and asking you about the higher water things. And you've got like another 10 or 20 lectures that are all much simpler, much faster, and the learning objectives for it seem much simpler and lower order. In that case, the right strategy might be to put the higher order stuff off first and just go through the simpler lectures because most places you will have to be tested on every lecture at least once. In fact, I remember when I was in uni, one of my friends skipped the hardest five lectures of biochemistry. Like these five lectures would have taken like the same amount of time to study as all the other lectures combined for that topic. And they managed to get an A minus without studying the hardest lectures at all. They only focused on the simplest lectures. And because they knew that as a percentage, all of these lectures have to be tested at least once, they just mopped up a bunch of those easy points and they let themselves just figure out the rest with the hardest lectures to get like, you know, 20 or 30% of those questions right. But the moral of the story here is that when you're clear about the learning objectives and you're clear about the different orders that they're likely to test you on, it makes you have a much better judgment about what is relevant and what is not. So it's time very worthwhile to spend. After you do that, go through the lectures and keep that filter in your mind. Ask yourself, how connected is this information to everything else? Does it give me more logical reasoning and deduction ability? And make a guess on how many logic points it has. Spend your time to learn the things that have the highest logic points only, 
for as much of that paper as you can. You want to cover as many lectures as possible, focusing only on the stuff that has the highest logic points. And to be honest, if you can do that, there is a really good chance that with that alone, you could pass. Because especially if it's a multiple choice question, you've increased the chance of guessing the right answer from maybe like a 25% random selection to a 45%. But we still have day two. And so on day two, we're going to do the exact same thing as day one, but now on the slightly lower level of logic points. These are the things that you skipped on the first day. Still not those really, really detailed things, but the parts that feel like they are may be a little bit more important, but definitely not as important as the stuff that you covered on day one. And again, go through as many lectures as possible filling that out. And again, I know it's scary to keep just skipping all of this content, but you have gotta lose something. And again, you have to pick your losses. And so for day three, we're gonna spend this time looking at the learning objectives, looking at the different orders that they're gonna test you on and asking yourself, are there any really obvious gaps that I haven't been able to fill yet? And if you've got some more time, try to cram in using flashcards or memory palace techniques, all the tiny little details that you might need to pick up and just get through as many of those details as possible. If you can't get through them all, no big deal. You're already putting yourself in the best possible position anyway. And what you'll find is that when you walk into the exam, you're not really going to be that confident for any question, but overall, your chances of getting the right mark are going to be relatively high because you can figure out a lot of things. You can logically reason the right answers. If you like this approach, you thought it was interesting and you want to learn more methods like this, then this as well as basically everything else I talk about in all of my videos are covered in my guided learning program. This is a step-by-step -step guided training program that distills a decade of my experience teaching people to learn more efficiently so that you can have the smoothest and easiest and most error-free path of becoming more efficient learner. If that sounds appealing to you, then you can check that out at iCanStudy.com. There's a link in the description. Now, this method of cramming is actually really beneficial for some other reasons as well. First of all, it really helps to figure out that logic point scoring because it trains your brain to be more discerning with the information. This is a really important part of deep processing, which is, in other words, how intelligent you are. And that's something that you can train. I talk about that a lot more in my video around learner types. And the other thing is that if you have more days, like four days or five days or six days or seven days, or maybe even like, you know, like a whole semester to study for it, you can actually use the exact same approach but you just spend longer on each of the days but the phases and what you're focusing on at each phase of study remains the same in the first phase whether that's one day or seven days we're focusing on the higher logic point items and then on the second phase we're focusing on the mid logic point items and in the third phase aka maybe the few weeks before the exam will few days we're going to be going through lecture objectives looking at the different orders that we might be tested on looking for gaps and then mopping up all those little details that we'd have to rote memorize that we're only going to remember for a few days anyway and so that is the most cognitively beneficial way of cramming again i'm not saying you should cram but if you're going to do it you may as well do it the right way 